Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Benjamin Schneider from the Beth Israel, partner of Dr. Dan Jones, who's going to talk to us about small bowel complications, small bowel obstruction, all these major clinical problems in our daily bariatric practice. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I have nothing to disclose. So small bowel obstruction is an important uh, it topic to, to discuss. Some of the other speakers have, have touched on it earlier. Uh, it's, very, it's relatively common, occurring in 1 to 5 percent of our gastric bypass population. Uh, the, the risk of small bowel obstruction in this population is that you can't treat these patients the way you do your normal small bowel obstruction that comes into the emergency room. They're at higher risk for closed loop obstructions due to their changed anatomy. They're at risk for gastric um, distension and, and perforation. They're at risk for uh, um, intestinal compromise. Unlike a typical small bowel obstruction that comes into the emergency room, there's really not a role for simple nasogastric tube decompression and watch and wait um, that we were taught. Um, so early surgical consultation is critically important. That's something we have to educate our uh, ER physicians um, that we'd prefer to see these folks early. Uh, also important is that our physical exam and lab findings that we're used to, used to interrogating these people with are probably not that helpful. They may be negative, they may look, look um, fine, and in fact we're being led down an a, a incorrect path. Also, we are dealing with a, a sicker group of, of patients. Um, some of the previous speakers have talked about their risk of sleep apnea, their respiratory compromise. Many of these patients are still obese or morbidly obese. And, and uh, we would have heard, I guess, about some of the nutritional deficiencies these folks may be at, at risk for, uh, particularly if they've had long-term vomiting and, and disease. So you have to think about these patients a bit differently than, than we ordinarily might. So one of the very important things the, in presentation that, these, that gastric bypass patients may present with is typically abdominal pain. Now that's the leading presentation. It's typically epigastric in nature uh, to mid-abdominal. It's important to consider the chronicity of this, whether it's intermittent, acute, or chronic, um, as again, a previous speaker have noticed, noted, and the patients may or may not actually present with nausea or vomiting. It depends on whether the common limb uh, or the uh, biliopancreatic limb is obstructed. They may or may not have a, a bilious or, or a vomitus. If you have a patient that comes in with abdominal pain and vomiting, it's a surgical emergency until otherwise proven. Um, you have to have a very high index of suspicion. The reason for that is patients who present with greater than four hours of, of, of symptoms are at increased risk. At six hours, the risk of intestinal compromises is, is dramatically increased. So in thinking, you saw, you saw the previous slide of the anatomy. It's important to think about how the patient may be presenting when, why they may be presenting with uh, small bowel obstruction. Internal hernias are probably the leading cause of obstruction in, our, in this patient population followed by adhesions just like any other patient in that sense. Uh, we, we had spoke earlier about the anterior, uh, uh, anti-colic versus retrocolic approach. The anti-colic seems to have a lower in, in incidence of obstruction, both from narrowing at the mesocolic window, but also it, from some of the internal hernias as well. You have to be aware that these patients are at higher risk for ventral hernias um, and port site hernias, so that's something to consider. Obstruction at the jejunojejunostomy can be can occur due to uh, technical um, constraint, technical reasons, or or due to um, adhesions. Uh, we talked about it, uh, the risk of uh, ventral hernias is higher in this morbidly obese population, and consider other things like intussusception and bleeding. So just starting with internal hernia, there are typically three hernia potential hernia sites: the Peterson's defect which is behind the rue limb, between the mesocolon and the, and the mesentery of the, of the rue limb. With the anticholic approach, it's, it, this, this obviously looks different, but there still is a defect in this area. Um, with the retrocolic, the patients may have a mesocolic defect, which the, which the rue can slide um, cephalad, or, or other, if it's a large enough defect, you can actually have other loops of small intestine slide up through there. Also, there is a defect at the jejunojejunostomy, which is, uh, which is at risk as well. In diagnosing internal hernia, you can, you can see how this might occur in the upper slide. You see that, there's that this is at the jejunojejunostomy, 
and below you can see the actual hernia defects. So this is what we're looking for when we, when we go to operations. In terms of diagnosing these, um, typically, typically uh, physical exam obviously is not helpful. Plain x-rays are probably not going to be helpful. Uh, folks have advocated for upper GI x-ray. I'll show you some examples of that. CAT scan is probably more sensitive. And then finally, as uh, Dr. Shermer said earlier, uh, lap early at laparoscopy. So this is a typical upper GI on a patient who has had a gastric bypass and has a small bowel obstruction. What are we looking for? Well, you see dilated small intestine. That's fairly obvious in the, in the left upper abdomen. Also, you look at the location of the rue limb. You expect the, most of the rue limb to be abo above the below the colon. Here, what we're actually seeing is uh, layered like coils of rope above the mesocolon. So you're seeing a lot of rue limb above the mesocolon. So this is a rue that has actually slipped up and caused an obstruction. Another thing that we need to look for is the gastric remnant. Do you see a bubble? Do you see an opacity? Because it may not have air, but do you see an opacity of fluid, which is a, a distended gastric um, remnant, which is, is ripe for perforation. If we were to get a CAT scan, there are a number of findings we need to look for. First, and probably the most pathognomonic, is the swirl sign. And that basically what you're seeing with in the, that the arrows are denoting is the mesentery and the, the um, vascularity of the, of the um, small intestine causing the swirl or hurricane sign. Because again, this is, this is more or less pathognomonic and should uh, prompt a call to the operating room. Secondly, we can look for small bowel obstruction. This is pretty obvious. Uh, you don't need a, a CAT scan maybe to diagnose this, but what, what the CAT scan will allow you to do is get a better sense for where this is occurring. You may be able to tell which defect uh, is, is to blame. The other thing to notice on this is that the uh, gastric remnant, which you can see just above the, the uh, rule limb there, uh, is dilated. And again, this, the, not that the small intestine isn't dilated enough, but a closed loop gastric remnant is really important to address early. <coughs> Another, the, another finding you have to be aware of is anast anastomotic displacement. Typically, the jejunojejunostomy will be in the left upper abdomen for most, most of us. And in this case, you're seeing actually the, the staple line of the jejunojejunostomy in the right upper abdomen. So this is what's probably happened in this case is the, the small intestine has slipped through the jejunojejunostomy, uh, defect, mesenteric defect, and now the, the anastomosis is actually displaced up to the right upper abdomen. Final finding is, is um, clustered small intestine. So not, on, not only do we see a swirl or hurricane sign in this case, but we also see that the majority of the small intestine is displaced to the left side. Uh, there's a relative paucity of intestine on the small intestine on the right. And this is again because the, most of the intestine is slid up through the slid through the jejunojejunostomy, displacing it to the left. In terms of how do we address this, where we've identified this, keep in mind that CAT scan only identifies probably 70%, so you have a 70% sensitivity. How do we address this if you highly suspect that there's a uh, internal hernia or if you've identified it on other study, studies? Um, for most of us, laparoscopy is reasonable to consider, but also if you're less adept at laparoscopy or you have very dilated intestine, the risk of perforation um, and, and spillage of succus is high. So there's really no loss in, in converting to open in these cases. It can be confusing. The anatomy, although it would not seem, it, it can be very confusing. Has, this, has, the, um, has, the, has the intestine herniated clockwise, counterclockwise, left to right? It sounds simple, but it isn't always when you get into the operating room. The, one, of the, one of the key tips that I learned years ago was to start at the, at the cecum, run the terminal ileum backwards, and in a lot of cases, during that maneuver will actually reduce the, the torsion and you will, it'll, it'll right itself without any confusion. Once you've accomplished that, it's important to close the mesenteric defect. Uh, that may have been the problem to begin with. It may not have been closed or they may not have been closed properly. And there, there, are, there is evidence to suggest using a permanent suture such as silk in your, in your closure has a, a higher likelihood of, um, of repair. Also consider placing a gastrostomy tube into the remnant stomach. There's a number of reasons for this, but there's really no simple way to decompress that stomach. And so later on, even if you don't have a dilated uh, remnant or biliopancreatic limb, this patient may have a long ileus after surgery, and you might find that you're getting gastric distension even later. So it's best just to put a decompressing gastrostomy tube in those cases. Another cause of obstruction is intussusception. This is a relatively uncommon uh, cause of obstruction, but we do see intussusceptions commonly. So if you get CAT scans on patients who've undergone gastric bypass, it is frequent that you'll see <coughs> an asymptomatic intussusception that doesn't require treatment. 
at the time of surgery, we'll often see small intestine uh, spontaneously intussuscepting on, uh, during surgery. Um, as I said, it, this is a relatively rare cause of actual obstruction, but when you have a patient who's had intermittent ab uh, abdominal pain of unclear source, this may, this may be something to consider apart from internal hernias. It's rare that we find a lead point. If we do, it's usually at the jejunojejunostomy, and there's a lot of thought why this may be occur. Why would you have intussusception? Uh, it could be that there's a lead point. It could be due to motility changes due to our anastomosis, or it could be due to back thought to be due to bacterial overgrowth. So there's a lot of theory and, and question about the cause. This is a, a CAT scan that we got some years back on a patient. You can actually see the intussusceptum and the intussuscipiens, and it makes a nice makes for a nice uh, slide. This is the same patient. You see the, the target sign or the bullseye sign of the uh, intussusception. <coughs> Treatment of choice is exploration and then resection. So here we are identi identifying the intussusception. We, we resect it, perform a jejunojejunostomy in this case. As I said earlier, my, my patients are heavier, so they have, they have a higher incidence of hernias. When you try to go re repair, whether with an open approach, you may have a 20 percent incidence of post-operative hernia. If you're putting a port site with laparoscopy in the midline, uh, the patients are typically or often will have a diastasis or at least thinning of their fascia, so they're very high risk for, for port site hernia. In a typical laparoscopic population, the risk may be half of a percent. In our patients, it may be higher. So it's very important if, if in, for bariatric surgeons to close all their, all their defects. I, I advocate for anything high, more than 10 millimeters should be closed. Um, Incisional hernias, as I said, 20% of patients with open operation in the morbidly obese group may have incisional hernias. <coughs> Some years back, Dr. Ide um, had presented a paper where he, he said that 8% of patients undergoing weight loss surgery actually have a thing, have internal, have uh, ventral hernias at the time of their surgery. It's, there's, there's evidence to suggest that you should fix those at the time of surgery in order to prevent co post-operative complications of obstruction. And in that case, the recommendation was to use either a biologic or a uh, coated polypropylene mesh. Another cause of obstruction may be at the jejunojejunal anastomosis. The uh, cause may, of this may be technical due to a short anastomosis or narrow anastomosis. The, some techniques to uh, avoid this are <coughs> uh, double firing or double longer staple lines. And then, and then closure with either a hand sewn uh, closure um, if, if you're concerned that you're going to narrow the actual lumen of the anastomosis. Uh, stricture may occur as well due to ischemia or other, other factors. Um, and it also, you'll see here is an anti obstruction stitch, uh, but also if, uh, something called a Brolin or anti obstruction stitch um, on, the, on the distal side of the anastomosis may prevent kinking at that point as well in obstruction. Also keep in mind, perioperatively, patients may, do, may have hemorrhage, which Dr. Wynn will probably cover in the next talk. Uh, but if you do have a clot, intraluminal clot, that may ob obstruct at the anastomosis. Later, if we talked about ulcers, if a patient has bleeding rather than perforation, that bleeding can also obstruct the ulcer as well. Uh, diagnosis uh, may be just CAT scan. And in this case, we you either perform a, a revision of the anastomosis or an enteroenterostomy, depending on how the anatomy lies. Uh, some take-home messages, um, typical anti-colic at the time of, of bariatric surgery to prevent obstruction. Anti-colic may hold a, a benefit. Close, close your defect, close your Peterson's defect with permanent sutures not absorbable. Laparoscopic operations tend to have a higher risk of in, internal hernia, probably due to uh, lack of adhesions. <coughs> Advocate for mesh repair of ventral hernias at the time of the initial bariatric operation. Close your port sites greater than one mil 10 millimeters. Having a, having a good uh, knowledge of the anatomy and, and potential causes of the, uh, the obstruction is important. Remember that symptoms may be vague and you have to have a high index of suspicion. Imaging studies may have a lower yield, 70% for CAT scan, and, under, and go to the operating room early. Thank you. Thank you very much.